My name is Brian Hintz, and I'm presenting today, let me keep this close, obviously, Michigan's 20 most common backyard feeding birds. Um, this is in conjunction with the Great Yard Backyard Bird Count and Project Feeder Watch. <clears throat> so the rankings that we get here are presented from Project Feeder Watch, managed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Bird Studies Canada. So this is an international project. Um, the data that we're getting is from Michigan, uh, from last year's count. Uh, this year's count is actually just going to be finishing up uh, a week from today, actually. April 5th is the last day available for that. Um, so the, no the numbers you'll see were based on uh, people in Michigan who, who tallied these birds. There were uh, 331 uh, participants last year in Michigan. And uh, we were also then grouped together in a region called the Great Lakes region with Wisconsin and uh, Ontario. <clears throat> this is some information about Project Freedom Watch. It's a uh, winter long project, it goes from November till April every year. Uh, there's a cost involved, but it's a chance to be a citizen scientist. What you, what you happens is what you do is you uh, register for the, for the count, uh, and then you assess a certain area. It could be your backyard, it could be your neighbor's yard, and on a certain day, a certain time, every, every week, you register and, and count the birds that you see in your yard. <clears throat> and it's based on those numbers that these rankings are based. <clears throat> and it has to be something that actually is in your yard. You can't see a bird fly over and say, I saw that. Let's get started. Uh, there's one thing to remember is that since this is a late fall to early spring count, there may be some favorite birds in here that you'll see in your yard but aren't included in this count because they're migratory. And let's get started. I said there's 20. I kind of fibbed. There's actually 21. Um, and the reason I had this one, the Cooper's Hawk, because it's kind of, um, what you would say, the other 20 birds are attracted by one of these. <laughs> and he's actually ranked. Um, so it's one of those consequences of feeding. If you, if you feed birds in your yard or you attract birds in your yard, one of the things you're going to get is a predator. And Cooper's hawks are classic bird hawks. They're a good sized hawk, um, smaller than a red tail, but uh, bigger than a peregrine falcon. And some information about the slide. Uh, the information on the slide, you'll see that that was how many percentage of people saw them in their yard or at their feeders, uh, where we're, we're ranked in the, in the Great Lakes region, uh, what their food source is, a couple of pictures, and then their distribution across North America. Um, Cooper's hawks, are, they will eat some rodents, but like I say, small birds, uh, especially things like sparrows, uh, about as big as they'll go after is a pigeon. And even with a pigeon, they can't. They usually can't even fly away with it. They have to uh, eat it there. And I've actually seen it in my yard where they've uh, gotten a pigeon. One of their uh, one of their interesting tactics is not so much that they um, what can I say they attack is actually swoop in to a yard and identify where the birds go to hide. Because when they swoop in, the birds will go to a bush or something like that and duck. Then the Cooper's hawk will actually stalk them into the into the bushes. Um, they're not afraid to dive into like abrovites, pine trees, and things like that to uh, to get their to get their meal. And uh, another somewhat interesting fact: a lot of times they're they're willing to stay and then eat, eat the meal in the yard where they just caught it. So you know, whether or not you can visual, visualize that, uh, you see the feathers flying afterwards. Number twenty this is the red-winged blackbird, kind of an iconic uh, bird on. Uh, I guess the classic picture would be on a cat cattail by marshlands. You see them, especially the males. Uh, if you look, a uh, picture on the right is a female. Looks more like a big sparrow. You never really identify them as a red winged blackbird. Um, on about 40% of the feeders, uh, they, will, they will come to feeders, especially um, as they're coming north. Um, in fact, it's been about the last two weeks that we started seeing them again back in the area. One of the things about uh, red-winged blackbirds is that they're uh, very territorial over their uh, nesting zone. I don't know if you've ever been gotten too close to one where they've dive bombed you. You know they'll give you a warning first. You know they'll give you some chirps, but if you get too close, they'll uh, they'll actually dive bomb you. But as you can see, the female, who's the one who sits on the nest, 
And they'll nest in like tall grass or in cattails. She sits on the nest, she blends right in, so it's real tough to tell that, uh, that she's around. Um, another habit of, of red-winged blackbirds and blackbirds in general is they will, uh, they will do multi-species flocks. So a lot of times when you see those big flocks of blackbirds in the sky flying around, a lot of times that's a combination of uh, red-winged blackbirds, grackles, cowbirds, um, even uh, starlings. Number 19 is common red pole, also known, and it'll, it'll come up a few times as uh, the nickname is the uh, Little Brown Jobs, LBJs. Um, kind of hard to distinguish between sparrows, finches, and other things like that. Um, what you see about red poles is they're not so much, they're not so common in the springtime or summertime around here. They're actually more of a northern bird, and they will actually a lot of times come south to spend the winter in Michigan. Um, last year, uh, that's why they're kind of up in the ranking this year, that's one of the reasons uh, that was called an, an eruption last year of birds. Um, in 2012 and 13, in northern Canada, they had a, they had a really bad drought. And there was a lot, not a very good seed production in a lot of the trees. So a lot of birds had to come south, and uh, red poles were one of them. Interesting thing is, again, they're very hardy bird for their size. Uh, they can actually uh, withstand temperature up to negative 55 degrees. Another interesting thing is they'll actually tunnel into snow for shelter if it gets too cold. The American tree sparrow. Another bird that actually comes um, south and, and, and uh, winters in this area. They're actually an Arctic bird. And kind of misnamed. They actually, uh, when they when they where they breed, which is in the upper part of Canada, uh, there is no trees. They actually nest on the ground. Uh, they were they were given um, that name by the uh, first uh, inhabitants, like the, like the pilgrims, uh, when they first saw them in the fall. They were hanging out in the trees, obviously, reminded them of sparrows from Europe, and gave them the name tree sparrows. Like most most birds, they need to uh, eat and drink constantly. Um, in general, a bird like this will need to consume up to 30% of its body weight every day. And if it doesn't, it actually can uh, either both starve or dehydrate within two days. The American crow. Kind of very uh, elegant looking bird, if you've ever seen them up close. Kind of have a bad, bad persona, but um, you know, in the sunlight, it actually just, they actually glow. They're one of the birds, um, if you remember about 10 years ago, uh, when the West Nile virus first came in this area, about 2003. Um, for crows, it's actually uh, pretty much a fatal disease. If a, crow, a lot of birds would get the, the West Nile virus and get sick from it. Crows, it was like 99% of the time, they would, they would die from it. So there was a big population crash, especially in, in, in Michigan about 10 years ago, and they just started to recover in the last four or five years. Well, the interesting thing about crows is, like they say, if you see a flock of them, they actually work in family groups. So it's actually an extended family if you're seeing a, a flock of crows. Um, they're one of the, the few birds that actually the previous year's young will actually help raise this year's. Yeah, so they will help out, bring food, things like that, watch the nest, and things like that. Um, interesting about crows is, and, and a lot of birds in general, you, you know, you wonder uh, if you're seeing your birds in your yard, you know, well, I'm seeing the same one every year, you know, how long are they going to, how they live. Um, on average, for most songbirds, um, a good uh, six to seven years is pretty much what you can expect out of them. If they're all conditions going right, no issues otherwise. Um, but for the most part, the average lifespan of most, most birds is about two to three years. Um, crows, um, the oldest one they've been able to define in the wild, and that's based on banding. They put the bands on them, so if they re-catch them, uh, was 16 years. But there was one uh, that someone had kept as a pet uh, and actually lived up to, lived up to 50 years. So, I mean, 
you know, they can if you treat them right and don't have any stress from having to catch food and things like that all the time. Uh, they can be long lived. American Robin, Michigan State Bird. Interesting thing about robins is everyone thinks that they, they should migrate to one of those migratory birds, but I don't know if anyone's, did they see robins all through the winter this year? Yeah. Um, what happens is, and, and even most birds, that uh, if they have a food source, uh, they will hang around. And last year, um, a lot of the, uh, your ornamental fruit trees, like your cherry trees, uh, crab apples, um, ornamental pears had really good crops on them, so the robins were able to hang around all year and feast off those. Um, everyone thinks robins just eat you know, insects and worms, but probably 40% of their diet is actually fruit on a given day. So, um, if, you know, like I say, in the winter, if you have a robin hanging around and you have some like old fruits and old blueberries and raspberries, you can toss that on the ground and they'll, they'll take advantage of it. Now, the interesting thing about robins is, I mean, since they are a ground feeding bird and they do a lot of things through uh, eating worms off grass, they're very susceptible to pesticides and, and things like that that you put on your lawn. The hairy woodpecker. Uh, one of uh, four species of woodpeckers that are fairly common in this area. Uh, very similar to when coming up to the, to the downy. Um, as you see, they have the distinctive black and white plumage. Um, and this is about the time of year when you'll start hearing uh, that the woodpeckers um, pounding on trees you hear like a drum roll, that kind of thing. That's, that's what they're doing there is either they're claiming a territory and saying, this is mine, or they're saying, you know, especially the males, hey, I hate females, I have a very nice look, come check, check me out. Um, so when you hear that, <clears throat> that's, you know, typically, you know, that's what they're doing. It's, it's trying to bring attention. Uh, normally, uh, a bird like that, a woodpecker, when they're going down a tree and pecking, they're not going to make so much noise um, because what will happen is if you make that much noise, um, all you're going to do is attract other people, other birds, saying, you know, oh, you may work for that piece of food, then someone may come and take it away from you. So, um, and another thing that you know people uh, dislike about woodpeckers is you have wood trim on your house, and they go and uh, you know make holes in your in your in your trim. Um, there's, there's two, two ways they're going to they're make either the small holes, which means that they're looking for insects. And if they are making those small holes, you probably do have insects in your tray. Um, because they're very good at finding that kind of stuff. Um, but then if they're making the nice big circular hole, they're trying to make a nest into your, into your wood. And usually what happens is, is they make the hole, get to the back and say, oh, I can't get any farther, but the hole's already made. So, you've got the damage. American starling. They are what you would consider nowadays an invasive species, originally um, native to Europe. They were brought to the United States in the, uh, let's see, 1890s. And that was at a time uh, there was actually organizations whose goal was to bring European fauna and plant life to America to make North America more like the homeland. So that was the end goal, was to bring, bring our species over here so it was more familiar to us. Unfortunately, you find out that's not always the greatest idea in the world. But, um, so from 1890, um, when they released about a dozen birds, actually in Central Park in New York, uh, they were able to then go across the entire continent within about a hundred years. Um, their biggest, one of their biggest problems is initially is they had, since they're invasive, they had no natural predators and they're very aggressive birds. So they were able to breed really easily 
and uh, they took over a lot of breeding locations for a lot of native birds, especially birds that live in cavities like woodpeckers, uh, bluebirds, um, sparrows, and things like that. So they were they were blamed for some of the decline in some of those species. Interesting fact about starlings, though, is actually they're um, they're very good mimics. Actually, some people who um, keep them as as pets and actually get them. Not to talk, but they will mimic um, other birds, they will mimic cats, dogs, things like that. <clears throat> Another interesting fact, even though they're thriving here in North America, um, especially in, in, in um, Great Britain, in the last 30 years, uh, for whatever reason, their population has actually gone down. They've estimated over 75%. So, Whatever's happening in Great Britain, habitat-wise, is not conducive to starlings, but they're uh, very, very comfortable here. Though, even though you can see them across the whole uh, continent, they're, um, they're very well adapted to people. So there's usually only in areas where there's urban environments. You don't really see them that much in, in the country or in forested areas. How sparrow, so number 13. Again, another uh, invasive species. Again, brought over the same way in about uh, 1850. They were brought over. Um, as you can tell, then they have uh, spread across the whole country. And again, they were introduced into South America about the same time they spread across most of that continent, too. And actually, they're in England, they're another species. They're actually declining about 40% in Europe and in Great Britain right now. And again, they're very similar to starlings. Um, they're very adapted to people. So you typically only see house sparrows where, again, where there's a density of people. So again, you won't see them, per se, up north or in the country. Talk to titmouse. The little bird with the big eyes. They are an insect eater in the summer and then a seed and fruit eater in the winter. Uh, tend to hang around with uh, Chickadees, nuthatches, and uh, downy woodpeckers in the winter in what they call feeding groups. You have multi-species flying around the same area. The more eyes you have, the better chance of spotting some food. So they kind of coordinate, help themselves out in that way. Um, they, are, they are cavity nesters, so they are a bird that will use a birdhouse if you have one. The house finch. Very similar, uh, especially the males, uh, to uh, the, the purple finch. The purple finch is, has the, the red on the, uh, on the head and the body. body. Uh, the house finch it has just more of the red, especially the males, just on the head, less on the, on the breast. Um, and if you look on the map, you can see that there's actually kind of two zones, west and east. Um, they are a native bird, but they're actually what you would call a native invasive. Uh, they're actually a west coast bird. Um, and they were actually introduced to the east coast uh, in the 1940s. Uh, someone had the idea that maybe they'd make a good pet bird. Uh, so they brought them over there to the east coast. And to give them some glamour, they called them uh, Hollywood finches. That didn't work out. Uh, they were not very conducive to being a pet. But uh, so what happened was the, the birds that were left over were released and uh, they uh, thrived. So since 1940, they've gone from, again, New York City across two thirds of the country. And probably in the next 25, 30 years, you'll probably see those two lines merge and they'll be across the whole continent. Um, one thing that, uh, especially finches, um, are susceptible to is conjunctivitis. Typically, it won't uh, always kill them, but it just weakens them enough that they're susceptible to other things like predators and, and things like that. <clears throat> Number 10, red-breasted nuthatch. Again, this is a bird that was uh, um, came in, in droves from, from the, uh, what they call the eruption last winter. Well, they are native to Michigan and not as common, but people were seeing them a lot more last year 
Actually, this year there haven't been spotted as much. Uh, the interesting thing about nut hatches, if you've seen them, is they're the, the, the bird that goes upside down on the tree. They all start at the top and come down instead of going up. And uh, um, the red breasted uh, is a little more solitary than, than the other nut, nut hatches in the area. And again, um, if you've ever seen them, why they're called nut hatches. Um, if you ever seen a nut hatch grab a seed, like a sunflower seed, take it somewhere, and as they pound the crap out of it to open up the shell to get to the to, the, uh, to get to the meat. Interesting thing about what nut hatches do is again they're another bird that's a cavity nester. Uh, they lose in that uh, um, birdhouse, but if they create their own um, hole in a tree, which they're able to do, what they'll do is first they'll make the hole a little bigger for them to fit through. And then they'll actually take sap and close it up a bit, just to make the hole after they've after they've made all this made it inside like they want to make it just big enough for them to fit through. So they actually kind of make a little doorway. The red-bellied woodpecker, one of the other woodpecker species, uh, one of the larger woodpecker species, uh, actually bigger than a robin. Um, What's interesting is that everyone calls it red-bellied, and they always confuse it with the, what they call the red-headed woodpecker. Um, so I include a picture of what a red-headed woodpecker is uh, on the right here. They are, uh, um, they are a very noisy bird, if you've seen them. They chirp a lot, sing a lot. And they are one of the birds that was uh, initially affected in, in competition with starlings for nesting locations, because they're just about the right size compared to a starling, so they would use the same size nesting sites. And then the interesting thing about woodpeckers is though they, you know, everyone thinks that they will um, grossly eat insects. Um, they will eat fruit and they will also uh, eat sap. So a lot of times, especially, there's also the, um, sp the uh, species called the sap suckers. And what they will do is, you will see, if you ever seen a tree, um, it looks like they've actually made a, like a, patchwork of holes, like let's say it's like a little square of holes, that's a, a sap sucker or a woodpecker. What they do is they draw those holes in, let the, let the sap ooze out, and then come back and lick up the sap. Blue jay. Uh, one of those birds that kind of uh, brings out emotions in people. You, you like them or you don't. I have a bad rap as thought of being a bossy, um, kind of, uh, I guess, aggressive bird, one bird that eats other birds, baby birds, and things like that. Um, there's been studies to, to, to look at that, and they found that probably less than 10% of the population actually has that trait, going in and attacking baby birds. It's kind of one of those things that they've probably learned from either their parents or stuff like that, but it's not a widespread um, trait. Interesting about uh, blue, two interesting things about blue jays is they're actually related to crows. They're in the same uh, family, and uh, they were actually in other words affected by the West Nile. So about ten years ago, the local um, blue jay population pretty much was almost extinguished, and they're slowly recovering from that. Another interesting thing about blue jays is um, you see the color on their you know, the blue on their, on their feathers, they actually have no blue pigment. It's actually a grayish white. It's blue um, because of the reflection of light, similar to seeing the blue sky that way. Their uh, two favorite foods, especially is if you have an oak tree, it's a good chance you'll see blue jays, they love acorns. And then the other thing that, uh, though it's not native to this area, the peanuts. And they're a bird, um, if you see them, they go back and forth, back and forth. They're actually stashing, storing food. So not every time you see them, they're eating it. They're going to put it somewhere for future use. And then what's usually happening on, on most birds that stash is there's, there's actually, they'll stash it. There's another bird that's actually watching them do that. The bird will fly away. And then that bird will grab that piece of, uh, of food and uh, eat it themselves. Um, it's actually quite common um, to, for uh, in, in Canada, where there's the other, uh, other species called the gray jay. Uh, they're not too common around here. 
they're, they're well known for watching Blue Jays and they stash food, then going in and grabbing what the Blue Jay just stashed. Dark Eyed Junkos. Uh, their nickname is the uh, Snowbird. The reason for that is they actually uh, breed in the Arctic and they come to Michigan to spend the winter. So they will arrive in Michigan right around late October to November, and they'll stay till about now. They should be starting leaving. Um, so they're not a year-round resident of this area. But um, they're actually probably one of the most uh, common birds in North America. Um, their population has been estimated to be in excess of uh, over 200 million. So they're very successful. Similar to it, uh, related to sparrows, and uh, they're a ground feeding bird. So there's something that you see on the ground, a little gray and white bird, and your dark eyed junkos. Here's the white breasted nuthatch, again, the cousin to the, to the red breasted. Uh, probably about uh, one third bigger than the red breasted, a little more common. Again, we'll. we'll um, Flock again in the winter with the chickadees and titmice and woodpeckers to do food uh, food flocks. Um, very vocal, especially the males. Um, typically, you hear them before you, you see them as they do their little chirp. <clears throat> Number five, the American goldfinch, um, one of everyone's favorites. One of the one of the myths that you constantly hear about them is. You know, we're waiting for the goldfinches to come back. Well, they actually don't migrate. They actually hang around all year in Michigan, like it, unless it gets really cold. Um, but what happens is, especially the males, they go from that bright yellow to a gray, dingy green. Um, and the females turn even a little dingier. So they, they stay around all, all year long, but uh, they kind of blend in after the fall. And it's about now, um, if, you, if you've got them coming to your yard, it's about now that they're starting to turn yellow. They're starting to get a little dingy yellow on um, some of the males. What's nice about uh, feeding goldfinches is to use the um, Niger thistle. It's kind of to see that not, everyone, not all the birds will use, so you can actually uh, get a feeder for them and they'll come to that exclusively. And you, can, you can spot them better than having a typical feeder where you have half a dozen different species flying around. Uh, another interesting thing about uh, goldfinches is they are um, one of the few birds that actually are strict vegetarians. Um, they don't actually supplement their diet at all with any kind of insect or protein. Um, it's a benefit for them um, in the way that, uh, in one way, um, they're not on the list this year, but uh, Anyone know about cowbirds? Uh, what a cowbird is, it's a, it's a blackbird, but they're actually called nest parasites. So what they do is they don't build a nest and, and raise their young, they lay their eggs in other birds' nests and let the, let the other birds raise their, raise their chicks. So what happens then is that's like the detriment to the other chicks because what happens is the, the cowbirds um, typically will actually hatch first and since they're usually bigger than most songbirds, they'll crowd out or kill the, the other birds, and then the parents just raise the cowbird. But since uh, goldfinches are strict vegetarians, uh, if a cowbird lays an egg in, in their nest, um, what will happen is the cowbird chick, chick will die because it doesn't get any protein from the uh, goldfinch diet. Number four, the northern cardinal, another fan favorite of everybody's. Um, now we were saying before how the uh, blue jays uh, don't have any blue pigments. There is the cardinals and flowers have red pigment. Another interesting fact is um, they call the northern cardinal uh, not so much for the fact that their range is in the north, because actually probably in the last uh, 200 years or so the range has actually expanded north. Um, they were more of a, a southern bird originally. But uh, out of all the species of cardinals that are found in the New World, they are just actually the most northern found species. So they were called the northern cardinal. Uh, interesting thing about uh, cardinals, if you ever watch them, is they're kind of like uh, first in, last out at a feeder. You know, they'll come right at like sunrise and then at dusk. And what you see a lot of times is they, 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 they tend to uh, pair bond 
throughout the season. And you'll see the um, first the female come in, and you'll see the male be watching it, and let the female feed, and the female go out, and the male come in and feed. And another interesting fact is um, female cars are also one of the few uh, what you would call songbirds that actually sing in addition to the males. In most most songbirds, it's only the male that does the singing, but female cardinals will sing. And uh, cardinal is another one of those very um, what you call territorial birds. So they will really defend an area. They're they're very well known for being one of those birds that attacks windows, attacks the reflection uh, in like uh, rear view mirrors of cars and things like that. Morning dove. Interesting fact about the, the morning dove is it's actually um, in the United States the most uh, most hunted bird, most commonly hunted bird in, in the United States. We don't hunt them in Michigan uh, currently. They tried it about five years ago and there was too much backlash for, uh, to try and hunt them. But if you've ever watched them, how they how they take off and fly, they're actually very difficult to watch. They don't. They kind of just go all over, they have a very erratic flight, uh, they would be very difficult to, to hunt. Another thing about them, if you've ever seen one, or seen one on a nest, they probably make probably the worst nest of any kind of songbird. It's usually about four or five sticks flattened on a tree, and somehow the eggs will actually just somehow stay there, but they're very, very indifferent nest makers. And then another thing that you'll see too is, is if you ever see them uh, on the ground vigorously feeding, just going down, feeding, 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 watching well, how much are they gonna how much are they gonna get in their stomachs? What they're typically doing is um, all they're doing is first filling up their crop, which is a little sack above the above the stomach. And then they take, after they fill that up, then they'll go off uh, and let them digest the division after that. So it's not they're just not shoving it in just for any reason, they're just getting ready to eat it, finish it off later. Um, talking about ages, the oldest documented uh, morning dove was 31 years old. Number two, the downy woodpecker. Uh, as you can see, very similar to the uh, hairy uh, that we saw before. Uh, probably about a third smaller and a little more, obviously a little more common. Main difference between them is, uh, again, about size and uh, the hairy woodpecker has a thinner lighter beak than the, than the head. And then the number one, everyone's favorite, the black hat chicken. Not only are they, are they number one, but one of their advantages is they're very indifferent to human activity. Uh, they're a bird that you can actually bring in and have feed off your hand if you're patient enough. A lot of times, even in my yard, when I'm putting out the, um, the food, filling up a feeder, you know, I'm still filling it up and they're right there going, okay. Ready. They're another bird that will, uh, again, if you've seen them, ever seen them at a, uh, coming out of feed to your feeder, going back and forth, back and forth. Um, typically, they're not eating all that, they're just stashing it somewhere for later use. Another bird that will use a birdhouse or a cavity nest. And then these are some of your migratory birds that, uh, because of the way the count goes, uh, don't show up in the, in the count. Some of your missing favorites. Your uh, Baltimore Orioles, your hummingbirds, your eastern bluebirds, your pigeons, those beaks, cedar waxwings. Uh, Baltimore Orioles and ruby throats will be coming back probably oh at the end of April, early April, late April, early May. Uh, bluebirds um, are similar. Actually, they're related to robins. So actually, sometimes they will stay the winter just like robins. There were actually people who saw them all winter this year. Another bird that will eat fruit and things like that if they have the opportunity. And then the cedar waxwings, again, mostly a fruit eater. Some more favorites again. I talked about the cowbird, uh, the northern flicker, which is probably the largest of the common woodpeckers in this area. Um, interesting thing about flickers is that they're actually uh, more of a ground feeding woodpecker. Uh, one of their favorite foods is ants. So a lot of times you'll see them on the ground, pecking at the ground, and they're going after ants. And then the, uh, the common grackle, which if, you, if you've noticed, they've just returned in about the last week. Yes. 
very distinctive bird, uh, the flicker is, um, especially um, they're a little, they're a little sensitive to activity. A lot of times they'll, when you see them on the ground, they'll fly away. If you ever see that, uh, they've got the white patch on the, on the rump. If you've ever seen that bird like that flying away from you, that's going to be your northern flicker. And like I say, then the common grackle, which has uh, probably, if you notice, just returned about the last 10 days or so from, from their migration. Um, not a well thought of bird. Uh, they tend to be a little loud, aggressive, coming flocks and tend to chase everything else away at the, at the feeders. But uh, um, what's interesting about it, if you ever see them up close or in the sunlight, they actually kind of glow with an iridescent color to them. They, they like that one. That's all I had at this point. Well, thank you today.